Hi everyone, this is Bradley Ball. Uh, I am your moderator for this session of 24 Hours of Pass. I uh, want to welcome you. The subject we're going to be covering is field testing buffer pool extensions and in-memory OLTP features in SQL Server 2014. With us today, we have uh, Ross Laforte and also Rick Hyatt, uh two wonderfully experienced gentlemen in the SQL Server field. If you've been involved in the SQL community for a while, uh, then you are certainly familiar with these gentlemen. Ross, I, I don't think I have access to be able to advance the slides. Go ahead. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, no, for some reason it's still not doing it. You're, you're selected. Hmm. Okay, I'll select you again. Okay, no problem. Try again. <laughs> No, it's it's not working. I tell you what, if I could get you to just hit next for me, I'll I'll run through these and turn it over to you guys as quick as I can. Sure. So everyone, uh, for technical assistance, uh, one of, just a couple housekeeping items, real quick. Uh, if you're having any issues, just raise your hand and use the hand icon on the right side of your screen, and someone will assist you. Uh, to maximize your screen, use the Zoom button located on the top of the presentation window. Feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A field at any time. The question pane is also located on the right side of your screen. And once we get to the Q&A portion of the session, I'm going to read off your questions to the speakers. Since all the attendees are muted, you will need to submit your questions by typing in the Q&A field. Uh, please note that there will also be a short evaluation at the end of each session. Uh, as speakers, we truly appreciate your feedback, so it's very important to us. Please take a moment to complete it, uh, and it will show up on your screen. Uh, and then I'd like to say a big thank you to Microsoft. Um, oh, and Ross, if you'd like to go to the next screen, please. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Microsoft is our global partner. Um, without them, the staging of 24 hours of pass would not be possible. Uh, especially without their support and dedication. They are the reason that this event is free of charge. So uh, big thank you to Microsoft. Really appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, the next slide we have is on the PASS Summit for 2014. Uh, you definitely want to join us. If you have not been to the summit before, it is essentially like the 24 hours of pass on steroids. Uh, you get about 600 uh, professionals from Microsoft that will come and be a part of the conference at some point in time. The SQL Cat team is there. Um, it's taking place in Seattle, Washington from November 4th to the 7th. Uh, the PASS Summit 2014 will also feature over 200 sessions with world-class SQL Server experts. Uh, we have planned and presented this by the SQL community, by volunteers from the SQL community. So this is literally our conference as uh, a SQL community. PASS is single-handedly the largest gathering of SQL Server and BI professionals in the world with over 5,000 attendees. Um, PASS is also a great place to network and to meet people face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to be able to talk with MVPs and other experts and also your peers uh, and exchange knowledge. Uh, more importantly, PASS delivers on providing you the answers to SQL Server issues along with the knowledge and strategies and skills you need to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, so contact your local chapter leader. You've got a discount code that's available to you uh, for $150 off. This is also available to the virtual chapters. Um, so make sure you contact the chapter leaders to be able to, to get this money off. Uh, and right now the price for the PASS Summit until June 27, 2014 is only $1,595. That's a wonderful value. To find out more about the PASS Summit, please visit www.passsummit.com. And one more slide, Rick. I'll introduce you guys and turn it right over. So uh, our two speakers today are Ross Laforte and Rick Higgis. Uh, Ross is a technical architect at the Microsoft Center in uh, Chicago. Uh, he has more than 16 years of business development experience, project management, and SQL architecture. He's also one of my co-lead authors on the SQL Server Pro 2014 admin guide that we're working on. Uh, so really excited to get to watch him present today. Uh, Rick Higgis is a SQL Server MVP, uh, an all-around nice guy, a solutions expert with scalability experts. Uh, he also has an MBA in MS and also MIS and, and a BSCS. Uh, Rick has been very active in the SQL community for years, also a wonderful presenter. Uh, so without further ado, gentlemen, I turn it over to you and have a great session. Great. Thank you, Bradley. So um, again, what we're going to be talking about here today is field testing the buffer pool extension and in-memory LCP features in SQL Server 2014. 
I'm Rick Higgins, and with me today is uh, Ross Laforte, who will be present presenting uh, this information. Uh, so one thing I really want to do is try and set this up in the right light. And really, we have a very dynamic and changing world that we live in. And so what I did is I said, well, let's have, take a look back about 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years is a great time frame to look at to see how much things have changed, especially in technology. So on the, um, in the middle column here, I have 2004, and on the right column, I have 2014. And so I'm going to take you back 10 years ago to how things were. Uh, for example, our most CPUs that we worked with were single core CPUs. Today, there are multiple core P CPUs. I think I don't think you can buy a single core CPU anymore. Now, back in 2004, hyperthreading was just really starting to uh, catch on. However, uh, with some of the SQL boxes I worked with back then, uh, you often ended up with a blue screen of death if you enabled hyperthreading. And that, now today, we have multi-core CPUs with hyperthreading turned on, and it just works great. That's because SQL has changed, the hardware technology has changed, and the OS has changed as well. Uh, also, RAM, about you know, 10 years ago, most SQL boxes I worked with had maybe four, eight gigs of RAM. I did work with some that you know, were on up there, but, but 10 years ago, four to eight gigs of RAM is your, your typical box. And that's because we're using a, a SQL Server um, version of 2000 running on 32-bit hardware, and you really only could access natively four gigs of RAM. Yes, you could do some memory tricks to get beyond four gigs of RAM, but it really wasn't a true flat memory space like we have today in 64-bit technology. Uh, now, most servers you buy often come with 32 gigs of RAM, or you can go on up from there. Also, storage. Ten years ago, a lot of the SQL boxes I worked on had direct attached storage. And so, and the SAMs were just really starting to cut on, but, but you looked at really, well, what, you know, how many spindles do I have? And uh, what type of RAID uh, configuration do I have them in in order to, you know, for my data versus my logs versus my TempDB? You know, all that type of stuff is where the decisions that we had to make back 10 years ago. Uh, today, with SANS, a lot of that conversation has shifted to the SAN administrator and how that box is actually set up and working with the vendors with their um, um, suggestions on how things should be configured. And also, if you're one of the cool kids today, you also have a flash drive or two in your, in your storage, uh, in your, sorry, in your, in your server for uh, local storage, like for TempDB, et cetera. Um, just think also our, our CRTs took up half our desktop space. Uh, now we have multi-display flat panels. Usually, actually, uh, in my environment right now, I have my laptop with an attached display. So it's, you know, we're, get, we're able to do so much more with less. And 300 gigabytes was a large database uh, 10 years ago. Today, that's that's not huge, and often we see terabyte databases are, are just not uncommon these days. And virtualization was a novelty back 10 years ago. Today, it's a necessity, and it's very pervasive throughout, throughout everywhere. So, you know, just think about how, how we were 10 years ago and where we are today. And so, there's lots of ways that we can take advantage of this new technology. Uh, with SQL Server 2014 that we were unable to do to before. So to give you some background about the testing, um, the location was the Fusion IO lab in Salt Lake City. The main players uh, from Fusion IO were Brian Walters and Joel Grace that did uh, most of the heavy lifting. And uh, from Microsoft, we had uh, Ross Laforte, who is presenting with me today. He's the MTC lead. And we also had uh, two program managers from Microsoft involved, uh, Jeffney Kuryoshiv and Jamie Redding, um, who helped out with uh, designing the tests and um, anal analyzing the data. And also from scalability experts was me and actually several other architects that uh, also chipped in on these conversations as well. Um, so our goals for this uh, field testing 
was to explore if the new features of SQL Server were having the right storage solution can make a big difference. We want to extend the official testing to new levels to find scalability limits. We want to determine use cases for further study, and I've come up with uh, we've come up with some other things that we want to actually explore further with these features, and also develop some white papers documenting the field testing. So let's talk about uh, the buffer pool extension feature for a minute. And uh, it's, this is a little difficult to do in this environment, but I usually like to ask a question, you know, what is the single thing that you can do for a server in order to increase performance? And, um, you know, I get, the first answer, of course, is add memory, and that's what I think of as well. Um, other people say, well, get a faster storage solution. That can help out as well. Uh, there's one solution that um, I, I always suggest, and that is to, to uh, delete users. Hopefully you had got a chuckle out of that, because if you delete users, especially that one user you know about, you can get improved performance. Anyway, for all seriousness, really adding more resources, especially memory, uh, can make a huge, tremendous effect on performance. And that's what, the, what we're doing here with this feature. We're extending the buffer pool to non-volatile storage. Uh, it could be an SSD or an SSD array. And actually, the feature doesn't really know it's going to an SSD. It just says, give me a file name somewhere and the size, and I'm going to pretend that my buffer pool extends out to that area. Now, with the BPE, only um, clean pages, so no dirty pages are written to the BPE. And that's so we minimize data loss. Uh, this means we're going to have uh, performance gains or potential performance gains for things like read-heavy um, OLTP workloads. So if you have a transactional system, you're doing lots of reporting off of it, doing lots of reading of the data, then BPE may be able to help out depending on your workload. And one of my favorite things about this feature is that there's no application changes. You enable the feature and go. It's a simple three-line command that we'll show here in a second. It's very simple syntax, and it's for the entire instance uh, whenever you turn this on. So you don't have, it's not you know, database specific. It is all the databases within the instance will be, um, be able to take advantage of this feature by enabling it. So by using BPE, basically the, the way you turn on is it's an alter server configuration command. Uh, alter server configuration, set buffer pool extension on, Inside parentheses, we have a file name and a path, and uh, a file name, and the size equals and then the size of your buffer pool. Um, and then there, we have a DMV to be able to check the status of it to see what type of, um, see how much is being used, etc. It's very easy to turn off as well. Uh, the ultra server configuration uh, command is also used to turn it off. So it's very simple syntax. Don't have to worry about getting developers to understand anything different from what they're doing. They just keep doing what they're doing. You make the change, and you go. Um, so what we've really found is that you know, the good scenarios for using this feature are, the, again, the read-heavy LTV workloads. We find that also a lot of the index pages that are in the buffer pool often migrate themselves to the BPE and that makes a lot of sense because often the indexes are not being used heavily, but need to. Uh, but if you have changes to them, they can be pushed out of the regular buffer pool into the buffer pool extension. And we also recommend high throughput SSD storage, high endurance SSDs were, are suggested as well. And if you're worried about things like uh, White Cliff and things like that with SSDs, a uh, lot of things have changed over the years. Uh, so get yourself educated about uh, SSDs. Uh, to help you understand um, what, what they are like today. Um, now, limitations. If you have a truly data warehouse type of workload where you're doing lots of scans, et cetera, um, BPE is probably not going to be the solution for you. It may, sure, it may help, but there's actually another feature in SQL Server 2014 called the Clustered Column Store Index, which is built specifically for data warehousing scenarios. So I encourage you to find out more about that particular feature that we're not going to talk about today in this session. I think there's another session later today on 24 Hours of Pass about that. Um, and also, if you have a write-heavy LTP workload, 
um, because BPE is just for clean pages, it's not going to be utilizing that if you're just writing majority of the time. Um, and, but another great thing about BPE is it is a feature in standard edition in SQL Server 2014. So you don't have to say, well, is an enterprise only type of feature? No. This is a, um, a feature that's available in standard edition as well as enterprise edition. There are some limits with it within standard edition versus enterprise, but still uh, it's a great value for uh, those of us who need to use standard edition. And so now um, I'm going to show you a demo uh, using BPE. And this is kind of a, it's, it's a video demo that we recorded uh, back in May. Um, we'll just we'll set this up for you. And that, that is um, taking, getting BPE to warm up can take time because as the algorithm inside there works, it says as, it's, um, as pages get flushed out to disk, that's really when BPE gets populated. So uh, what we've done is we have a workload running. When we start this video, we'll have a workload already running. We're going to look at some performance counters. And then we're going to turn BP, BPE off. We're going to disable BPE. And we're going to see those numbers just fall to zero. Um, and we'll take a look at some of the performance counters there as well so you get a kind of a, an idea of you know, here, here's the workload with BPE, and here is the workload without. And, okay, so we, as you can see, um, we have uh, some drives here. We have the H drive, the M drive, and the O drive. The H drive is where our data files are living. The M drive is where our BPE file is living. And the O drive is where our transaction logs are. We also have a T drive, which is not displayed on here, uh, for temp drive. One thing I want to point you to is the uh, under SQL Server Memory Manager down here near the bottom. Um, it has uh, we see our total and target server memory is at eight gigs, but our database cache memory is over two hundred gigs, and that's because we're using the BPE feature. And that our alloc and we have uh, SQL Server Buffer Manager area right in here. We see that um, we're using a, a large amount of our BPE that we allocated. We allocated 256, in this, um, in this particular scenario, 256 um, gigs. Now also down here at the very bottom, batch requests per second, we see that around 4,000, 5,000 consistently. So this again, this is what we're looking at with this particular workload. It's a TPCE type of workload that we're running here. Um, so I saw 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 even batch requests per second running here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to um, slide over to the left hand pane and we're going to again issue that ultra server configuration and actually execute that to turn BPE off. When we do, we will notice that some of these numbers went way down. Uh, to, uh, in other words, uh, buffer manager, uh, extension LK pages, zero. All those things are zero, basically. Um, when we get down to our um, SQL Server memory manager, our database cache memory, uh, as you can see, is well below our 8 gig lim um, memory limit because we just took away over 200 gigs of BPE away from it. And also look at our bash requests per second. They are around 1,000. Uh, batch request per second at this juncture. So as you can see, whenever we were running with BPE, we had um, a, you know, we were able to run you know, 4,000, 5,000 batch requests per second. Now we're at about um, 1,000. And trying to advance, Ross, can you help me out here and see if you can advance to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. So now we're going to talk about looking at some of these results. Um, just to, so you know what our test configuration was, it was a Dell PowerEdge 720. Um, we had two, a two-socket box with uh, two 12-core Ivy Bridge processors 
That meant we had uh, a total of 24 cores, and we turned hyperthreading on, so we had actually 48 schedulers going with this box. And you probably have a similar box in, in your environment today as well. We had 384 gigs of RAM in the box, and we also had a 2.4 terabyte IO Drive 2 Duo uh, SSD in there. Uh, we also had an enterprise class storage array with the, with the typical type of setup that you might see in, in your environment with the number of spindles and, and things of that nature. Uh, just so you understand that we tried to make this as um, what, similar to what we see when we go out into the field uh, as much as we could. So what we did is we did some testing. And so what we did is we gave the SQL Server instance uh, 16 gigs of RAM and we ran tests against it. And then we also ran the exact same test with 8 gigs of RAM, but with a 256 gig BPE onto it, right? So we're using half as much RAM, but then we are extending it by giving it a, a huge uh, buffer pool extension as well to see what type of the results uh, we might get. Now, here is just, uh, as you can see, with the database cache utilization when we have 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of BPE. When we first start the test, of course, um, it takes a little bit of time to start warming up, but then it says, oh, wait a minute, I got this BPE file here. We're going to start pushing things to that. So our blue line here at the bottom is just showing our total server memory. The gray line is the average of SQL Server Buffer Manager over the extension as used percentage. So as you can see, as time goes on, as our and the orange line is the database memory cache size. So as that grows, um, naturally our percentage of use of uh, that this new feature grows as well. Um, so this will allow us to process more data. Here on the left-hand side, we have batch requests per second. The blue line is 16 gigs of RAM only, and the orange line is 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gigs EPE. And as you can see, the um, number of batch requests per second that we are processing is about 37% higher than we were with just RAM. Uh, for CPU utilization, this is huge here. Um, again, a blue line is uh, for 16 gigs of RAM, orange line is 8 gigs plus BPE, and we are able to get about 300% more CPU utilization out of, our, out of the same hardware by using BPE. Um, and a as time goes on, the, the buffer pool extension becomes the primary source of reading data that you need to access for your database. Again, here we have the number of the orange line um, actually indicates the um, average of the SQL Server buffer manager uh, over reads page reads. It's a local resource in this case that we had set up here. We're getting up to about a, a gig of throughput is average here, uh, whereas uh, from, from our enterprise class storage, storage array, uh, we're having under 200 megs. And we again, we have better latent, um, we have low latency uh, using the SSDs because it is, in this case, local to the server, and we have again with writes a little bit higher latency. I'm sorry, reads a little bit higher latency than writes. Um, but that is typical on an SSD. And also the database disk reads. Uh, as we can see, as time goes on, we are decreasing our reliance on that enterprise class storage array. So this means that if you are having lots of other workloads at that same enter enterprise class storage array, that you're actually going to help their performance as well because you're not referencing that enterprise class storage array as often because you're reading more from your local SSD. So this, that can be a, a, um, a way to extend the life or performance of your enterprise class storage array is by enabling BPE on a local-based SSD. 
And then, of course, because we're taking on some Roblox, our transaction log write performance also increases. We're able to do more work. And really what all this ends up to be is that by using buffer pool extension feature, we have um, the high-speed flash drives deliver DRAM-like performance. It's just like adding, almost, it's almost like adding more RAM to your system. Um, increasing utilization by uh, 300%. We also were able to increase transaction log throughput by 20% and also offload database rates from the disk rate by, by 20% as well. And from our testing, the sweet spot for using BPE seems to be approximately 64 gigs and less. And that's because uh, once you start getting enough memory in your server, that means that your SQL Server is, is able to manage that memory more efficiently and can move things around, etc. So it doesn't need to really push things out to BPE as quite as often. So once we go over 64 gigs of RAM, you get diminishing returns. At least that's from, from our experience. So I know a lot of you know, new servers that we find today have 32 gigs of RAM. That's just a starting point. You can have a lot more than that. So what we're actually looking at for additional testing is to get to the point where um, we can have BPE associated with VMs, and we're working on determining some best practices for, for that to happen, whether it's an SSD that's locally based into the server or an SSD array. Uh, that, I think that's where we're going to find where this can be a very viable feature to all of us. So of course, reporting on an LTP system is going to be uh, where this can be very useful as well. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Ross Laforte to talk about the in-memory LTP feature testing that we did. Ross? Yeah, thank you, Rick. So um, yeah, this is the other side of uh, the testing we did uh, during this uh, uh, engagement. We also proved out how in-memory LTP features uh, scale and perform uh, and how they behave. So, uh, so basically, the first thing I want to maybe ask, uh, uh, get out on the, on the table is, what is SQL Server in memory LTP? So, you know, it's, it's kind of new with SQL Server 2014. It's a great feature. It's not like people who have used previous versions of SQL Server. There was some such thing as DBCC paint table. It's not the same thing. It's just a new. Uh, new actually architecture to scale OLTP uh, uh, large workloads, large amounts of users. So basically what it does is takes advantage of, of uh, the latest hardware architectures uh, with a lot of memory, a lot of CPUs. And primarily what happens is in a typical environment that, you, that uh, we have these days is that uh, when you run a typical SQL Server, um, you may have a lot of CPUs and a lot of memory, a lot of capacity of the server, okay? Because these days you could easily buy a, 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 a hardware server with, um, you know, 36, 64 cores, you know, 512 gig of memory. But one of the challenges that that's facing a server like that when it's running SQL Server is the locking and latching that happens inside the database because the database was designed for page. Uh, for, for locking, for, for paging, it's designed design around a paging our architecture. So a page gets locked, rows get locked, so those resources are actually waiting, uh, CPUs are waiting to do work for a latch or a lock to release. So what this, this feature allows you to do is eliminate the, the locking and latching in the database and so that more concurrent users could be on the system at any one time uh, and uh, driving uh, the CPU and, uh, and, and, its, and, the and the capability of the server to maximum capa uh, a, a capability that, that's, uh, that's available to it. In this particular case within memory LTP, you could selectively choose which tables you want to put in memory. By choosing those selective tables, those tables will, will actually uh, not have 
any latch and locking in them anymore. They basically become a new architecture, no, no more paging type of architecture. Therefore, uh, any, any lack and lock, and latch and locking just goes away. It becomes, an op it becomes more an optimistic and currency control environment. Okay? So any table you, you decide to move there, that's, that's what would happen. In addition, you could compile start procedures to go against those in-memory tables so that they will run much faster uh, versus interpreted T-SQL. So the start procedure could be compiled in DLL to actually access an in-memory table to increase performance even further. So what you do when you move a table into memory is you eliminate the latching lack, lack, and locking that, that typical database system um, inhibit. So uh, one of the questions usually asked when you do that is what happens to durability? Even, even when the table is in memory, SQL Server does maintain durability unless you tell them otherwise. It will maintain other durability for that, for that data. Both the transaction log has to be written to disk um, as any other operation that the database does. Uh, this is no different. The, any, in memory tables, any updates, any inserts, deletes will have to be written in disk. And that's one of the reasons why you need a fast uh, transaction log disk is to uh, make in-memory LTP run faster because it could actually flush that, those data points into disk very quickly. Now, the way this works is um, in-memory tables need to live in, in, in an in-memory uh, memory optimized file group. Basically what it is is you define a different file group in your database. So you add a file group and you define that file group to be a memory optimized file group. Okay. Uh, now all of the so, so that basically all your in-memory tables will end up living there. And you hope hopefully for best possible performance, which you'll see in, in some later slides, is if you have it on a flash SSD type of drive, you're going to get faster performance uh, uh, because you know, the, your writes are going to be faster. Typically what happens is in-memory uh, optimized file group will actually do more sequential I.O. Uh, writes. So overall, performance is still improved even if it wasn't on flash drives. A flash drive actually provided us uh, just just a, a, an added boost of performance. So um, so you could have uh, within a file group you have many files, okay? And um, and basically the all of the operations are committed and are logged as normal SQL operations. And again, that's the reason why we actually uh, tested. Um, tested this configuration um, with an SSD as well just to prove out and to, de to identify what are the performance characteristics as we move to faster disk. Now you can say, well, what happens when I move tables in memory? What happens to all the integration that I have with SQL Server? How does Management Studio and all the capabilities that SQL Server provide, how do they operate when I'm in memory table? Basically, backup and restore works the same way, okay? Outside of piecemeal restore, uh, which is also supported, okay? Uh, full log backup, they're all supported. Failover clustering is supported because actually the file, the file group actually is, is migrated from, uh, to the other server, part of failover clustering. Availability groups is also supported. So you could, as long as you have, you have, sec you could have secondary, has has the memory optimized tables in memory and has an, a, 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 an in memory file group, it, it just the same operations still apply. Okay. Um, DMVs, Kellogg views, they're all supported as well as there's additional ones for in memory OLTP. So overall, SQL Server Management Studio will operate against I, an in memory table just as if it was any other regular table. Okay, so all the operations that you as a DBA know how to use these days will still apply. 
you, 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 the, 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 there's no learning curve to actually um, to use these. So performance factor for in-memory LTP, basically the data resides in memory at all times. So what happens is, is when you define a table to be in memory, all the data lives in, actually is pulled into memory and stays in memory. Okay. Uh, which means is you will, will also have to monitor how much memory the table that you selected. So now you can be very selective. You don't have to move the whole database in memory. You want to move very specific tables in memory. Tables that are actually have a lot of contentions, a lot of latching, and tables that are highly used, which I'm going to describe in a, in a demo that I actually, uh, in, in, a, in a case study that we actually did uh, um, around that. Now, one of the ways you could help monitor how much memory uh, your in-memory tables are using is by using Resource Governor. Resource Governor does have a way to bind the database to a resource pool and to manage memory usage for in-memory OLTP tables. So that's an addition that was implemented with SQL Server 2014. Other factors that improve performance of in-memory LTP is this subsystem performance because, again, the transaction log has to be written to disk uh, because even though the table is in memory, uh, we still have to have durability. And CPU, because eventually you will max out your CPU because without latching and locking, well, the server is the server's going to run as, as fast as it possibly can uh, and eventually you reach the maximum capacity of the number of cores and memory available on your system, which is a good thing. You're using your server to its maximum capacity and, and, and getting the most out of it. Okay, so one of the questions is that um, typically comes around is how about migration? How do you go about migrating to an in-memory LTP uh, solution? We, we provide within Manager Studio um, some reporting, an analysis migrating and report tool, which is a AMR, which actually what it does, it collects transaction reporting um, performance to identify um, tables and also store procedures that would benefit to be, uh, to be put in memory. So in other words, it identifies tables that, that, that would be good candidates to be migrated to, into a memory and also helps you identify store procedures that would be good candidates to be compiled in, in DLL to provide you faster access. So, so these, these, these reports, which is uh, part of the management there warehouse, actually provide you their recommendations, which I'll show you in a, in a, in a, in a demo just uh, in a few more slides. Uh, in addition to that, to help you migrate, there's a memory optimization advisor that will help you actually go ahead and migrate a, uh, a table into, in, into memory. Basically what it does is actually guides you through the process of identifying if there's any gotchas or if any, uh, any compatibilities so you can resolve them and then it will walk you through the steps to, to fully migrate that table. In addition to that, there's a, a native compilation advisor for, 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 um, for, for your uh, store procedures. So you want to comp compile your store procedure to native code as well. Okay. So here is what we're going to do is we're going to do a demo to show you one of the one of cases where we actually migrating a, a few a table and a few store procedure made a huge difference to a solution. And this was because I worked with a with a customer that uh, was an airline reservation system. So whenever they run a, a major sale, okay, everybody's searching for the best deal. So there, there's a lot of people just going to that site and and just just and just and just uh, checking different dates, different times, different locations, diff different destinations. So so the system during those times becomes extremely extremely busy, okay, um, and uh, we also found that there's a few tables of store procedure that actually make the biggest difference to, to uh, that operation. So what I did here actually is we 
uh, I'm going to show you how a system, and this is a demo of, a, of, of, of an airline system, how it would have run before. So if I kick this off, it's pretty much running with a lot of latching and locking. Okay? And, and you're getting about a thousand um, transactions per second. Because you notice, notice the latching and locking is happening in, in uh, uh, the latching going on here. The CPU is really not driving 100% because you know, just the resources have been, you're waiting for resources. Okay. So, so, so notice what about a thousand per, uh, you get a thousand transactions per second. You could add more CPUs, and this system actually had, uh, it had actually allocated 12 cores and 60 gig of RAM. My, that, 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 this, and this is my demo system. So this is a demonstration of what happened with that airline system, and, and, and just, uh, it just uh, uh, demonstrating the capabilities that they actually were able to gain from, from a switch. So now I go and do an, so I just stopped the, stopped the, the, the test. And they went to the reporting and went to analyze, identify um, uh, uh, tables that would be good candidates to be put into um, in memory. Now, now basically, what you, what you typically find is there's a very few tables uh, that really uh, will benefit from it. It's the ones that usually have the highest contention, and those are probably like eighty percent, eighty percent of your workload. Okay, like 80, 20 percent rule. So in this case, it was one specific table, take the reservation detail, that that would give you the minimum migration work and the highest gain. Okay, so going through, uh, you could go now through the wizard and migrate it. In this case, to make it quicker, okay, I just did it right from the from 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 the demo system. I just I just uh, executed the uh, the command to migrate it over. Okay, and I click on migrate, and now notice how much performance improvement just just by making a simple change, a simple one table change that I was able to gain from from this uh, this operation. Now I'm using the server at 100% utilization. Okay, notice there's no current no latching going on anymore. Okay, it's, it's running it's running now about six seven times faster than it ever ran, ran before. Okay. Now, typically, what you find at this table uh, of, of this airline system, uh, they might be a table too. They're, they're the, the highestly used tables, and there's probably few store procedures that access that table, and they're the ones that actually are interpreted over and over and over again by by thousands and thousands of users. That's it's running concurrently. Okay. So I'm actually going to go back to the system, and uh, and do a a uh, and look at uh, store procedures that that access that table um, and uh, migrate those into uh, natively compiled store procedures. So by doing that, now these thousands of users don't have to every time they execute that execute that store procedure don't have to go through the server doesn't have to go through through the compilation. Um, um, uh, the interpretation and compilation and, uh, and the execution. So it's all pre-compiled. And so performance, now only improved now seven times. We get a like 23 times of better performance just by doing those simple steps uh, to, that up, to that airline system. And this is kind of simulation of what happened once we did that. Okay, so with that I'm actually going to going to move on to the next slide. So what applications are suitable for, for, um, for in-memory LTP? It's, it's basically when it's look for data that's very highly used, tables there have a lot of locking and latching going on, and tables there are not very big, so where they could fit in memory. Okay? So you want OLTP-like transactions, like very short lived transactions with a lot of concurrent users because that's when latching locking is uh, is the highest is against those type of upper, uh, type of workloads example stock trading travel reservations order systems okay okay 
So there's some limitations, which I'm not going to go into very details, but you know, there's a few limitations uh, around what could be, what, what, what would be a good candidate for a table that could fit into memory, like for example, triggers, uh, no DLL, DML triggers, they, some data types are not supported, constraints, some constraints are not supported. And also there's some limitations for natively compiled store procedures that you can do. Okay. So this is where we're going to examine some of the results. What, what, uh, when we ran against um, um, an SSD, we were able to get better performance because that actually uh, allowed the in-memory OLTP system to run even faster because it could actually uh, write transactions to the transaction log, flush the, 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 the data to, to the memory optimized um, file group faster. So typically what we found is that we actually saw an improved customer experience by running in a, in a flash drive. So for example, as you notice, the, the, the user wait time re was, was uh, reduced. Okay? We were able to serve more customers. We were able to improve business productivity. Okay? Total transaction process over, over 45 minutes was you know, easily four times more. And we were able to deliver better service level agreements because, for example, when a server actually shuts, when, when you take a database, an in-memory LTP database, and, sh and shut it down, let's say for maintenance or, or something, once it boots up, or if you fail over, once it boots up, all that data needs to be brought back to, into memory. All the, all the in-memory tables need to be pulled into memory. We found that with, with a flash drive, we were able to pull the data into memory faster as well. So we were able to bring the database online faster. We did the testing on a Dell PowerEdge, okay? 384 gig of RAM. Uh, we had uh, some flash drives on it, and we and uh, this is the storage that we use for um, um, for what we compared against. So overall performance, transaction log writes, um, latency improved, as you can see here. Uh, transaction log reads were improved. Uh, overall, everything everything we uh, we noticed this, there was a, a greater improvement in overall performance when running on, uh, on flash uh, versus enterprise uh, uh, disk array. Okay. We were able to process 4.4 4 times more transactions. Okay. Um, in addition, we saw that the uh, transaction log writes megabytes was more consistent. Okay versus e, an enterprise system. Because the flash drive okay, was able to move better maintain uh, and better support to that operation. Uh, transaction log uh, writes latency was also improved and you can see it's a very straight line, very, very linear versus a very jagged enterprise line here. Uh, also uh, when we looked at startup, database startups, we were able to start up the database faster because the flash drive is able to deliver the data up to SQL Server faster versus an enterprise system took a little more, took more time to bring the data online so that the server becomes available. So the server here became available faster once it was, once it is, it is turned on. Okay. Um, I also um, we're able to do checkpointing again very consistent uh, very easily supportable more supportable by a by a, a flash type of operation versus a a, a, a disk array operation um, the file group performance improved as well continuous checkpoints was more consistent as well and, and higher Okay. So uh, we actually did a scaling at 12,000 users. We actually had the system running with 12,000 current users. We actually pushed it up to 24,000. The, the challenge we ran into past 12,000 is that the, that the enterprise disk array wasn't able to support it. 
So the 24,000 usage was just to show that the flash system was able to go faster and support more users. Um, so we can actually compare against the enterprise system uh, in this array. But uh, overall, we can see that we are able to scale to much higher throughput. Uh, so the flash environment, we're able to support this, uh, the in-memory LTP to a better extent. Uh, showing that with 24,000 current users, we're maintaining uh, a very consistent uh, operation with transactions per second. So what are some of the, the uh, use cases for in-memory LTP? You want to look for, for um, tables that, that, that have a lot of lock and latching. There are a lot of contention that the contention is kind of causing a bottleneck that's preventing your server from utilizing its, its and, 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 and performing at the highest level. And so that you could use the AMR tool to identify those tables and then use the advisor to migrate those tables. Okay, um, that's, that's uh, one way that uh, also in memory OTP instead of VM could also help you with uh, startup performance. So with that, I'd like to pass it on to Rick to actually do a final summary, and then uh, we'll be done. Go ahead, Rick. Great. Thank you. So basically, uh, choosing the right type of storage can dramatically affect performance of uh, key SQL Server 2014 features. And from our early work with uh, BPE, uh, it appears to be linear up to a certain point, uh, 64 gigs of memory, then the utilization of BP kind of drops off from there. Uh, we, because of time and resources, we couldn't really push it as far as we wanted to. <clears throat> and also, uh, in-memory OTP benefits uh, from wicked fast local storage on stream logs and hardened data on startup. So that was just kind of uh, you know, some of the things that we found. We have um, some references here for uh, about some of the testing that we've done. Uh, thanks to our friends at Fusion.io. And uh, questions? Um, I think we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, Bradley, do we have some questions? Oh, yeah, we got a lot of questions. So um, one of the biggest ones, I'm going to try and tap, tackle this subject all in one because we, we've got a lot of questions on this, are basically the use cases for the buffer pool SSDs. Uh, the okay. server that was used had 384 gigabytes of memory. Uh, but it was, it was restricted to 8 gigs, and then uh, it had a very expensive Fusion I.O. card associated with it. Uh, so a lot of the questions are, how realistic is it that you would throttle the server such in that particular way, as well as what are some use cases where we'd actually um, expect to be able to see this in play in a production environment. Um, let's see, uh, there's a lot that we have on the cost versus the realistic scenarios. I didn't know if you guys could extrapolate that. I assume that you're using a test system and you're trying to mimic a lower amount. Would you use this in virtualization? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to fit everything in in one particular question, but uh, I'll let you guys go from there so we can try and tackle that. Okay, sure. So one of the things that we you know found when we start, started doing our testing was that once we got up to a certain point or in memory that SQL Server that was utilizing, that just it, you just didn't see a big benefit from using uh, the buffer pool extension, and so we started to scale down the amount of RAM, um, trying to find where it's going to be the most beneficial to use this type of feature, and that's what I kind of uh, reference as saying we now have some ideas for some further testing, especially around um, virtualization. So I can see where if you have uh, VMs, where a lot of times when I go into uh, system, uh, a lot of customers and we're going to virtualize uh, their environment, they want to either overcommit in memory or they just want to power as many VMs as they can into a, you know, into a single server. And so I, I can see where this could be a very beneficial feature um, for in that type of scenario where you have VMs with uh, limited amounts of memory that they that they can have access or be guaranteed access to, 
and having BPE, BPE enabled for those um, VMs. Now, that's where the, the next thing comes into play as well. How can, um, you know, with virtualization, you think, well, one of the big benefits of virtualization is moving your VM from host to host to host and, and moving that around. And if you have a local-based SSD, which is what we were testing with in this case, um, if we have a, a local-based SSD, um, you know, how is that going to work? And that's really where we're going to take the testing next. You know, see, you know, first of all, if that's possible to make that work realistically in a, in a virtualized environment, or if, there, if you need to go to some type of SSD type of array in order to get that benefit, and then to then also look at the, the cost justification of that, right? Uh, that, that's definitely you know, part of the, the entire equation. You know, one of our focuses on, on our testing here was to see how far we could push, push this particular uh, feature. And, and uh, you know, that's kind of where we ended up at. So yes, we did cap a lot of our tests at the lower end because that's where we see a lot of uh, the potential of this, the real big benefit of this going. Did that answer, did I hit on, I think, I hit on most of those um, aspects there. Ross, do you have anything else to add to that? No, no, I think I think one of the reasons, uh, I mean, you want to say, why were you restricted? It was just so, otherwise it would take a very long time to get a real uh, a real good test because it takes a long time to fill the, the buffer. That's one of the reasons why it was restricted to actually get a reading out of the system. Not, not, yeah, and, not and, and, and also another point, we actually had done a lot of testing on another, in a different environment, and we, we found something out that uh, basically invalidated a lot of those tests, so we had to restart our testing all over again. So, that's, so we had very limited time in order to uh, come up with um, you know, some, some testing that we felt was going to show the, you know, the potential benefit of BPE. And the yeah, the behavior. So if, if you were in a situation where you found that you could not scale your memory uh, for whatever reason, um, then that would be a situation where you would look at using a BPE. But if you could scale your memory, uh, of course, because SQL Server is an in-memory product, it, it would be beneficial to, um, to scale the memory before you scale to a BPE. Is that correct? Repeat that, please. Uh, so if, if you were in a situation where somewhere the um, the hardware was restricted to where, uh, be it if you were in a you know distributed retail environment, something like that, maybe you have very small boxes that couldn't go beyond a certain amount of RAM, um, theoretically, that would be the place where you would want to look at scaling the buffer pool to uh, a BPE if for some reason you couldn't add more memory. But before you go to the cost of an SSD, you would look at scaling the memory first. Would that be a correct statement? Yeah, to, to a certain point, yes, right? Especially with um, the standard edition, right? You can, well, in, in 2012, you can go up to 64 gigs of RAM. 2014, mm -hmm. you can not go up to 128 gigs of RAM. And so if, if you're able to, um, and, and we've, we've seen the test, is that SQL Server does a pretty good job with memory um, utilization um, once it gets, you know, in that 64 gigs and higher range and that BPE is not as uh, beneficial in, in, the, in those cases. We saw that. And so, yes, if, if you can add memory, that is going to um, probably be a, a better route for you rather than just buying an SSD just for the, for the sake of it. Um, however, if you, do, if you do have an SSD put in, then you can also utilize the, SS, the entire SSD does not have to be dedicated to uh, BPE. You could also use it for TempDB or, um, or, or data files or other things like that. So it's not something that I'm putting this SSD in just for BPE. You could use it for other things as well. And the SSD doesn't have to be a, uh, uh, in a PCI slot. Could, and as long as you have the bandwidth, it could actually be on, on, uh, on, a, on a SAN as well. You may, you may get a little better performance being on a PCI uh, uh, but uh, that doesn't. We're not implying that you have to go buy a. P, uh, you have to buy an SSD uh, for that uh, to be on a, on a 
be placed right on the computer on the server itself. Um, we're just saying that you get better. No, and, and the more, yeah, and, and you're absolutely right in the fact that a lot of hardware nowadays you will be utilizing an SSD um, it, as something that you have on your server, and so by default right. you would have that hardware. You could do an extension. Yeah, um, right, exactly. And, and I apologize, everyone. Uh, I, there are a lot of great questions. Um, I, I hope we got to them as, as best as we could. Uh, Ross and Brick, I want to thank you guys very much for your presentation. Uh, thank you again to Microsoft for sponsoring this in the past for having us. Uh, I know we have to wrap up at this point in time. And uh, the next session.